Welcome to Bird for Joy, a show about discovering all the different ways that bird watching can bring joy into our lives. I'm Candy Lanfite, your gracious host and fledgling birder. Here at Bird for Joy, we focus on listening and watching the birds around us, being curious and learning what the birds have to teach us about joy, life, and ourselves. So grab your favorite beverage, settle on your perch, and let's get into today's episode. Little did I know when I decided upon the main theme and the title for my birding podcast that the idea of watching birds for the pure joy of it was an actual thing. I'm not saying that I thought that I had come up with a novel concept. Obviously, I realize that there are countless others out there that acknowledge and experience the joy that we humans receive from bird watching. But what I mean is, there has been actual research done about the different emotional experiences that we have when it comes to either counting birds versus just simply watching them for joy. In the UK back in 2021, Professor Miles Richardson from the Nature Connectedness Research Group and his research team, along with the participation of the Self-Isolating Bird Group and the assistance of Alpkit Foundation, conducted a research experiment. Here are the experiment's details from the Nature Connectedness Research blog. 156 people took part in the study, and they were randomly allocated to one of two groups. The first group, the count group, were asked to watch the birds in their garden for 30 minutes, identifying each species and then counting how many individual birds of each species visited the gardens. Something similar to like the big garden bird watch. Now the other group, the joy group, also watched and identified birds in their garden, but instead of counting them, they were asked to rate their feelings of joy on seeing each species. Now, all participants filled out a survey before and after the activity, which measured their feelings of well-being, anxiety, and their connection to nature. The research results showed participants in both groups had improved well-being, decreased anxiety, and a stronger connection to nature. But the decrease in anxiety was greatest for those in the joy group whose anxiety levels dropped by over 20%. Now, this suggests that paying attention to feelings of joy can enhance the psychological benefits gained from watching birds. These results show the positive impact of watching birds and suggest that activating a sense of joy heightens the benefits further. The research team points out that because the participants were members of the self-isolating bird group that the results do not represent the general population. However, they do hypothesize that the anxiety level decreases and enhanced feelings of joy would and should be greater if the participants weren't current bird watchers or already connected to their local birds. So, to sum up, the research offers evidence that joy watching, which is the term Professor Richardson uses, has greater emotional benefits than merely counting birds. Now, as a newbie birder and someone who is learning her way into the world of birding on her own, I am nervous about putting myself out there as a quote-unquote joy watcher. Part of me is weary of being ridiculed for not being a serious birder because I don't want to keep life lists, and nor do I care about chasing the next rare bird. But finding this information about the research project gives me the courage to keep birding for joy, despite what others might think or say. It seems that the proof is in the bird seed. Birding for joy makes us less anxious, happier, and more connected to nature. And when I think about the vulnerability of putting myself, my ideas, and my thoughts out there for others to see and hear, I'm reminded of something that my daughters tell me on a regular basis. Despite the risk of others judging what or how I do things, what I say or believe, I should always just do me. So here's to being bold and brave in my birding ways. And my biggest hope is that it resonates with others and they join me on this journey. 
And I almost forgot, there was a side part of the experiment that showed that certain species rated higher on the joy scale. Now there's a visual graphic on the blog and I will link to it in the description notes, but it appears that the smaller the species, the higher it rated on the joy scale. So we don't have time to go through the whole entire list, but the highest rated bird on the joy scale was the long-tailed tit, and then the lowest rated bird was the wood pigeon. The long-tailed tit are adorable, stubby, fluffy little creatures with nearly no neck and lollipop stick tails. Now we may not have these most joyous birds in North America because their native range is mostly from Europe through Asia. But when I watch their cute plucky behaviors on a YouTube video, which I will also list in the show notes, their personality reminds me of another species of the tit family, the chickadee, specifically the black-capped and Carolina chickadees. Now, there are seven species of chickadee in the world, but for the sake of today's all about that bird segment, I want to shed the spotlight on the black-capped and Carolina chickadees. When it comes to the chickadee, the word cute is an understatement. Both of the Carolina and black cap chickadees are adorably round, and I often see them referred to as borbs. Think a cross between a bird and an orb, with invisible necks, round heads, and tiny bodies. Although the black cap chickadee is slightly larger than the Carolina chickadee. There are also slight plumage variations between the black-capped and Carolina. Both are capped and bibbed and sharp-dressed in black and white. But two obvious differences are the nape of the black-capped's neck is white and the nape of the neck of the Carolina chickadee tends to blend to gray. Also, on their secondary wing feathers, the black-capped chickadees are tipped in white, whereas the Carolinas are gray. As learned on the Sibley's Guide website, the black-capped chickadee's voice is lower pitched and usually just a two-noted call versus the Carolina's higher pitched and two to six or even sometimes seven-noted call. I think for me, it would be easier to see their visual differences rather than their call notes, but everyone is different and some people might find it easier to distinguish the species by sound. But lucky for us, there is one easy way to tell the two species apart, and that is by their location. There is an excellent range map for the two different species on the eBird.org website, showing that the black-capped chickadees show up in the northern regions from east to west, and the Carolina chickadee are mostly in the southern region of the eastern states. Of course, then it tends to get slightly confusing along the line where those two ranges connect causing a hybrid zone where the two species are sometimes known to interbreed. Studies are showing also that because of climate change, what is known as that hybrid zone is shifting more northward. Now, both species have perky personalities, but according to the Sibley website, the black-capped chickadee tends to be slightly more inquisitive and much bolder than the Carolina chickadee. They both dine upon mostly insects, seeds, and berries, and they are both frequent visitors to backyard feeders. The habitat for the black-capped and Carolina chickadee is mostly mixed in deciduous woods, willow thickets, groves, shade trees, in open woods, and along the forest edges. They typically nest in holes in trees or a small natural cavity of rotted wood, and sometimes in an old woodpecker hole. And normally, both species have one brood per year. And now, here are five fun facts that pertain to both species. Number one, chickadees usually mate for life. Number two, chickadees weigh less than one half of an ounce. Number three, the oldest banded black capped chickadee recaptured in the wild had lived 12 years and 5 months. And then the oldest banded Carolina chickadee recaptured in the wild had lived 10 years and 11 months. Number four, chickadees can gain as much as 10% of their body weight each day and lose it all again during a cold winter night. 
And number five, a group of chickadees is called a banditry, referring to their cute little black masks. Before I wrap up this week's episode, I have a short but sweet story to share. Last weekend, my grandbabies were over visiting. After we finished up water time outside, my almost three-year-old grandson discovered my binoculars on the picnic table. Now he's a gadget kind of kid, so I knew that once he got his popsicle sticky fingers on them, it was going to be tough to get them back. So before a battle of the bins ensued, I dashed inside and retrieved a spare pair that I don't use. Now he's been aware of birds since he was about six months old. When we would point them out as they flew overhead, we'd always say, hi bird. So I showed him how to look through the binoculars and explained how Gigi uses them to watch the birds. Now, every time we'd hear a bird chirp or tweet, he'd ask, what's that? And then I'd start to explain what species we were hearing. But before I could finish up my answer, we'd hear another bird and he'd shush me quiet. Seconds later, he'd ask again, what's that? We went on for a good 10 minutes like that until he decided that it was time to go inside for a snack. I was impressed. 10 minutes is a long time for a two-year-old's attention span. Birding with bubs did my Gigi soul a lot of good, and I look forward to more birding adventures with him in the future. That wraps up this week's episode. I hope you all have a birdieful weekend. Thanks for tuning in, y'all. If you are enjoying the show, I would love it if you would follow or subscribe, rate, review, and then let others know about the podcast so we can continue to build a community of like-minded birders. A big shout out to composer Jonathan Boyle for his cheerful show music called Plucking Happy. The spoken lyrics were written and read by me, and the full version with lyrics will follow this episode. Until next time, stay chirpy, my friends. And get outside, feel the sun upon your face and the wind in your hair, and bird for joy's sake. Bird for joy's sake, when you're needing more, a new beginning, feeling lost, alone, or blue, go into nature. Stroll to the melodious tunes of birdsong. Let it refresh your soul, fill your heart, lift your spirits. Yes, bird, for joy's sake. Witness the winged wonders flitting, fluttering, playing hide and tweet. Is there anything else so sweet? I think not. Well, save for the chitter-chatter of my own nestlings as they filled my early days. But sigh, no more, for they have long left the nest. And I now strive to find myself once again, discovering new things that I do best. Bird, for joy's sake. For our feathered friends have much joy to share, and it doesn't cost a dime, only time. And I don't know about you, but I am willing to give, to have a chance to live out my days, filled with curiosity, hope, and wonder, learning patience, the art of slowing down and being fully present, living in the moment, something I have long strived to achieve, bird for joy's sake and keep looking up. Let their constant cheer infect you, their tenacity provide you with lessons of never giving up, and looking on the brighter side of life. Prepare for entertainment with their quirky, chirpy silliness. Oh my, so much cuteness, happiness, and whimsy. You can't help but smile, and suddenly you'll discover Worries cease, frustrations fade, chaos calms and troubles melt away like snow in the spring. You will find yourself looking up and forward into the horizon, surrounded by song, hope and happiness perched in your heart, feeling renewed and fulfilled. Go out into nature, take a stroll, let the avifauna rejuvenate your soul and bird for joy's sake.